So again, let's not forget what we're doing. We, we know our three principal stresses and directions somehow. We, haven't, we talked about ways you can estimate or measure those in the last class, right? Well, at least, at least certainly the vertical stress. Uh, so we have our three principal stresses and directions somehow given to us. We rotate, we rotate those into a geographic coordinate system, which are aligned with northeast and down. Okay? And now what we're going to do is rotate that onto the fault, because our fault is defined with respect to northeast and down, going back to the very first slide. Okay? So that's why we had to, had to transform the, the tensor. Okay? We had to get it into geographical coordinates, because our fault is defined in geographical coordinates. Okay, so uh, this is that same picture. Um, oops, I'm trying to get it blown up there. Anyway, so this is the same picture from the first slide. It's just now I've overlaid a set of unit vectors on that. Okay, and so the unit vectors define. The directions with associated with the fault plane itself. Okay, so I, I may be a little fuzzy. Uh, you know, it's clear in the notes. You can see it, but this is this is a vector, a unit vector in that's normal to the fault plane. Okay. This is a so this is in, in case you can't see it. Right. This is a unit vector in. Uh, what did I call it? In D. In D, that's in the direction of the dip, right? And then this is a unit vector in S that's in the direction of the strike. Okay? So this is just a way to define our plane, okay? Now, does anybody remember when we, <coughs> when we de first derived stress geometrically? We used this tetrahedron thing, right? And I had to write a lot of equations and then take it in the limit as the tetrahedron got small, right? <coughs> well, let's look at our fault plane as we have it drawn there and extend it out infinitely. Would it not cut our up? East south axes just like a tetrahedron, right? So I'd have a tetrahedron that's um, traced out something like this. Something like that, right? Okay, if we extend that fault plane out infinitely. So now we're back to that same tetrahedron, right? Or similar one. And do you remember what the result of that equation is when we when we derive stress or how we got there? If you remember, we had an arbitrary traction acting on the surface. Right? And then we also had a normal f that defined that surface, right? And at that time, we knew the norm. We assumed we knew the normal, and we knew the traction. And we derived an equation that looked like this: that the traction is equal to the stress times the normal, right? And we did that to derive the stress, okay? So, all right. Where it's understood, this is a the stress is a matrix. This is a vector, so it's a it's a matrix vector operation, right? So a matrix times a vector gives you a vector. All right. So we did this at that time 
to define what the stress had to look like, and that's how we knew it was a tensor. Okay? Now, we're back in the same scenario, but now we know the stress. It's SG. And we know the normal. It's N. It's the same N, actually. It's the normal to the plane. Right? So we know the stress, and we know the normal to the plane. We can use this equation again to determine what the traction is. So the traction is a vector, a stress vector, that acts on that plane. Okay? And it, it, should, be, uh, it should be clear that you know, this is, there's an angle between it and the normal. It's, it's not in the direction of the normal. So it's, it's oriented somewhat arbitrarily from that plane that's defined by the normal. Okay? So, so we have a stress vector arbitrarily oriented from the plane. Then what, do we, what if we want to know its component in the normal? Do what? Dot product, Dot product of, with what? With the normal vector. Right? So keep in mind that when you do dot product operations, it's, it's like the, pro it's the projection of a vector onto something else, right? I always like to think of it like a shadow, right? Like if, if the floor here defines our coordinate system, and I hold my arm out like this, and it's a vector, and the sun is coming straight down on top, the dot product of my arm with the floor would be what you see on the ground as a shadow, right? Mathematically, it's the cosine of the angle, right? So that's what we're doing here. We have this arbitrary stress vector, an ar arbitrarily oriented, right? And we want to take its projection onto the normal to give us the normal stress. So that's just another dot product with the normal. So th we have that the stress in the normal direction to the fault plane is the traction times the normal. So you, you should also be able to see that that's just, I mean, we can plug it in, right? The stress times the normal times the normal, dot product normal. All right? Okay, so what about, so that's the stress in the normal direction. What about the stress in the direction of the dip? The shear stress, so I'm going to use the symbol tau. So what about the shear stress in this direction? So if I wanted to know, if I have this arbitrary traction vector, and I wanted to know its projection in the normal, I take the dot product in the normal. Now I'm saying I want to know its projection in the direction of the dip. What do I do? I take the dot product with the normal vector of the dip, right? So then I have T in D, OK? What about the shear stress in the direction of the strike? Maybe take the dot product in the, in the, with the normal vector with respect to the strike. OK? All right. So let's see. I think it's off the screen there. Try something. Let's get back.
There they are, sorry. They were off the screen. But so those vectors geometrically are just that. Right? So they are, if you know the angle of the strike and the dip as defined up there, then you just plug them in and you can get those normal vectors. So, this is just uh, the equations I just wrote out and, you know, with some explanation of what they are. Normal stress to the plane, which is the same thing as saying, you know, the fault plane, I guess I should say. Normal stress to the fault plane, shear stress in the dip direction, shear stress in the strike direction. Right? And we'll, we'll see soon that it's the ratio of the normal to the shear, which indicates whether something's going to slip or not, which should be intuitive to all of us, right, if you know anything about friction, right? If I, if I hold my hand down, apply normal force to this piece of paper, right, and I pull on it, applying a shear stress, right? So obviously the paper's not going to slip as long as I'm just all normal, right? If I'm just not applying any shear stress at all, not pulling on it in any way, it's never going to move. And now I begin to pull on it, I'm applying a shear stress, you know, between the surface of the paper and, my, and the table. I pull on it, not changing the normal stress. I continue to pull, continue to pull, continue to pull, continue to pull, and as I eventually, unless my normal stress is too high and I tear the paper, eventually, the paper will slip. That's essentially the same thing that's happening in a fault. So uh, we can work an example. So given this, now I, I already give you, understand here, this is SG. So I've already transform, transformed the principal stresses into the geographic coordinates, right? This is something to be, pay attention because I might, on a homework assignment, not do that for you. I might give you the principal stresses and directions and the angles for the geographic coordinates, so you have to make that transformation first, and then the angles from the geographic coordinates onto the fault. Right? So pay attention when you go to work these problems on what, what this is. But So here, I've already transformed the stress into the geographic coordinate system, and if we, and I give you the strike and dip directions, If you just plug in those values for the strike and dip, you're going to get a normal vector that's zero point eight six six zero point five zero. You're going to get a normal in the strike direction. 0 0.5, 0 0.866, 0, normal in the dip direction, 0, 0, 1. Okay? And so, what is the stress normal to the plane? It is SG 
in hat that gives me the traction vector on the plane. And then I dot that into the normal again. And if you work that out, you will get 40. If you plug that into your calculator. What is the shear stress in the direction of the dip? It's the traction dotted into the normal direction, right? What's the traction? SG in <coughs> dotted with what? In D. And if you work that out, you will get zero. All right. What is the shear in the direction of the strike? I hear y'all whispering. Speak up. SG in NS. And if you work that out, you will get 8.66. Okay? And so again, I give you the, the answers are there. And then I give you some other examples that you could work for practice. Yeah. I plugged in, sorry. I plugged them into I plugged in the strike in the dip that I gave you in the problem statement into those formulas. Yeah. So there's nothing magic. And again, it's it's just there's nothing magic about these formulas. We could have worked through the geometry, right? It's just the these are just the projections of the original coordinate system onto these normals, right? And so it's just a bunch of little geometric transformations that it just it's just geometry, that's all. It's not not mag these equations were derived from nothing but geometry. They just define the angles between the geometric coordinate system and the fault coordinate system. So I, I give you uh, some examples again that you can work through that you know the answer to, right? So he's, you know, I don't. We're not going to work them, but you have them here for different uh, faulting scenarios, and I give you the answers to them. So you can work through these for practice to know that you're doing it correctly, to give you some confidence on your homework and and the upcoming exam. Okay, so that's all that I have today. Uh, look, look for a Canvas notification for a homework assignment later today, and it'll be due next Tuesday.